Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to the third lecture on uh, phonology in this course, NPTEL MOOC course on phonetics and phonology uh, broad overview. So continue with unit 5 phonology, let us recap the things that we studied in the last class. So we now know that phonology is a field of linguistics which studies the distribution of sounds in a language as well as the interaction between those different sounds. And also phonology tackles the following questions. Uh, what are the predictable sounds in a language? What is the uh, phonetic context? And which sounds affect the meanings of words? And these are more or less the most important things. And we saw in uh, great detail as to phonetic context. We saw how um, English consonants can be different based on the environment, how alveolar sound and alveolar sound will be dental if there is a following dental fricative like a l can be pronounced as a velarized dental l as in wealth because of the following uh, dental fricative. Now let us um, look at uh, how phonemes look like in different languages of the world and recall that we have looked in great detail as to consonants in other languages and uh, if you have uh, gone through the previous lectures on sounds of the world's languages, you have seen the great diversity that is available in the languages of the world. Now uh, when we look at the phonemic system in general, uh, then we see that this phonemic system in Madison's uh, Sounds of the World's Languages 1984 survey shows that this can be constitutes almost the 40 percent of languages in the world. So what are these? These are the sounds that uh, we have seen a lot, the labial plosives, the alveolar plosives and these two affricates, post alveolar affricates, the velar stops and then the fricative f, the fricative sir, fricative sh, the nasals m, n, n, and l, y, and so these consonants are quite common in languages as well and also among vowels the five vowel inventory is uh, quite common in the languages as well. So generally this is a phonemic system which can be expected but we know from our previous lectures that uh, it may not be so because lot of complexity can exist in the consonant inventory of different languages. Normally an inventory will um, contain additional more unusual sounds as we already know. So unusual sounds often occur in multiple languages in the same geographic area. So that can also happen and a phonemic distinction in one language might be allophonic in another. So now we have uh, for the phonemic distinction which is allophonic in another language. We have an example from English and Spanish. And English and Spanish examples that you see here is with regard to the, uh, the tap sound that you, if we have here. So in English, uh, varieties of English uh, have a tap sound in this context where it is preceded and followed by vowel sounds in an unstressed position. Now that tap um, in English which is phonetic the environment is uh, vowels on both sides in an unstressed position in other languages that can be uh, it can be different. And so in English now if we take the sound T then if in initial and final positions it is the same uh, T. Okay. But the T can change 
in this environment when preceding and following there are vowels in an unstressed position. So, T goes to a tap when there is a following a preceding vowel and a following a vowel which is unstressed. The phoneme T is realized as a tap when it is preceded by a vowel and followed by a stressless vowel. And we can now see a derivation that we had seen previously. So, let us see the derivation now. So, where do you have vowels uh, between the T in this case and in uh, this case, right. And now, we have T a word initially, word finally. So, this is our data set. Now, additional information about stress. So, this vowel is stressed, but this vowel is not stressed and all these are monosyllables, so they are stressed. However, this vowel is stressed, the following vowel is stressed in attend. Okay. So, now data and attend are two different ways in which T can be pronounced because of the distribution of vowels and the stressless vowel in particular. So, where does the tapping rule apply in this one where it is flanked by vowels on both sides and there is no stress. So, we have data, we have tan, we have cat and we have attend. And however, now we have seen that flapping rule in English. Now, we have Spanish where the uh, flapping rule is, um, there is no flapping rule, they are just minimal pairs. They occur in exactly the same environment. So, um, the flap is there in contrast and they are separate phonemes. In English, T and R difference is allophonic, non-distinctive. Remember that if it is allophonic, it is non-distinctive and it is in complementary distribution. And in Spanish, T and R, R difference is phonemic that is distinctive. So, we could easily establish that in English uh, that in Spanish these are two separate phonemes because we have a minimal pair. So, what did, did the minimal pair show? That in exactly the same environment where we have two words where stress is initial followed by a vowel, followed by T and followed by flap here and where this is the stress syllable is this one, this is the unstressed syllable. Similarly, here stress syllable is this one, so it is the unstressed syllable in exactly the same environment T and the and the flap is occurring whereas, in English that is not happening. In English this T would not have occurred in it would have been the same word because the context determines that in this position there will be a the flap T as a result uh, we will not get the minimal pair that we are getting in Spanish because in Spanish they are phonemes. So, Phonemicization is the body of knowledge and techniques that can be used to work out the phonemic system of a language. And uh, minimal pairs, the most effective method in phonemization is to look for minimal pairs. And uh, minimal pairs are two different words that differ exactly in exactly one sound in the same position, exactly the same position as we saw for Spanish with regard to Spanish that the third and the flap, they are both occurring in exactly the same position and these are two different words with two different meanings. The absence of a minimal pair uh, does not prove much because there are also phonemes which lack minimal pairs, but that is almost the first test that is done to check if they are phonemes. And it is also known to be the most effective method in phonemization to look for minimal pairs. So, um, a language might lack minimal pairs for a few phonemes uh, by accident. So, um, if we look at the set of uh, vowels, we see that um, we do not get the entire paradigm of her and the in uh, the context where they are always occurring. So, what happened here? We had um, for this one, we had to use howd and hood, so which are not really minimal pairs, but these are contractions, cliticized, and as a result, we get these words 
and those kind of uh, things might always happen. We may not find exact uh, minimal pairs, but we can see that they are still phonemes. Then in phonemization, we also find near minimal pairs. There are cases in which it is impossible to find minimal pairs for a phoneme. And this occurs in languages with long words and large phoneme inventories. And near minimal pairs are pairs which would be minimal except for some evidently irrelevant difference. So some near minimal pairs for the and je. So we have desert and pleasure. We have neither and seizure. So are these exact minimal pairs? No, they are not exact minimal pairs because for tether we do not have tether. For neither we do not have neither. For lather uh, we do not have lazure. So why are these near minimal pairs? Because the following context is the same uh, but the preceding is not exactly the same. So for instead of ni we have c here, neither, seizure and instead of la we have a here. So uh, these are called near minimal pairs. So if there are large phoneme inventories then we may not find too many minimal pairs and near minimal pairs are almost minimal pairs but some not so important difference is always it can be seen in near minimal pairs. So the phonemic environment has uh, nothing to do with whether the or je occurs, the phonetic environment. And to find the rules that determine the appearance of the versus je, I would have to make use of a completely arbitrary collection of environments for these phones. And uh, if the rules cannot be found, then an analysis that claims that the and je are allophones cannot be justified. So we do not have rules for the appearance of the and je as allophones and hence we cannot collect environments for these phones. And if the rules cannot be found in analysis that claims that, that the and je are actually occurring in complementary distribution, it cannot be justified. So obviously uh, minimal pairs, it is the most straightforward method to establish uh, phonemes and also near minimal pairs require much more work because there is a little difference there between the pairs. And minimal and near minimal pairs are used to establish that two sounds belong to separate phonemes just like minimal pairs. And for establishing that two sounds are in the same phoneme, we need to establish that they are in complementary distribution. So if they're, that they are variants, that they are different manifestations of the same phoneme, we have to establish that they are in complementary distribution. And also it is useful to follow the method of compiling local environments. And um, compiling local environments for each sound, we construct a list of all its appearance each time including the preceding segment and if any and the following segment if any. For any given data set, um, it is important to do this work to establish whether uh, two sounds are in an allophonic relationship or if they are different phonemes. So the method of finding out complementary distributions is to compile local environments. And for each sound we construct a list of all its appearances each time and uh, including the preceding segment, the following segment and follow the data carefully to do this. So we can look at this Maasai data from Hayes 2009 phonology introduction and uh, we can look at these three uh, consonants k, g and r. Uh, you notice that they are all uh, back velar and while these two are stops and this is a fricative and the voice fricative and we compile their environment. So this is what is meant by compiling local environments. So when you compile local environments, we look at the preceding and the following segment. So this is what is being done here. So we have compiled the local environments here and we have found these. Now look at k. You can see that k occurs in a variety of environments. Word initially when it is so in a medial position after the word um, initial uh, bracket and this is how we represent that and between a consonant and a vowel and also 
word finally as this is shown this is the word final position this is the boundary and in preceding that also you will get ka. However, we do not get all these different word initial word final and uh, vowel and consonant environments for ga. For, for ga we see it is very consistently following a nasal and a vowel. Also for the villa fricative we see consistently throughout the data set in 9 examples we see that it is always occurs when it is flanked by 2 vowels on both sides. Now, this is fairly clear that there is some complementary distribution at work here because we see clearly that ka is occurring in all these different environments whereas ga and ga are very restricted. And we saw the complementary distribution at work here and the environments are very clearly what we saw is that ga when ga occurs is always na and then for ha there is always um, two vowels flanked and ka we cannot write an environment for ka because it occurs in so many diverse environments and we do not have any um, uniform environment which can be written in a simplistic uh, manner. Now, that is one established way in which we decide uh, complementary distributions and therefore find phonemes in a language. So, one important thing that we see here is that of spirantization. So, what does spirantization mean? It means that when a stop changes to a fricative. So, it becomes a softer it is called as weakening or hardening also. So, stop becomes a fricative this process is called spirantization and what is the stop which changes to changes to a fricative here? Here it is a velar stop which becomes a velar fricative and between two vowels when it is flanked by two vowels ka changes to r. And uh, also we find uh, post nasal voicing that is when ka go becomes ga there is always na preceding it and whenever there is a nasal the ka becomes ga in this context because of the preceding nasal it takes a feature of voiced and uh, that is called post nasal voicing. So, um, if we look at the derivation here now uh, we see that we have the two words there coco which is grandmother and uh, garment diminutive is enkila and trees is el cake. Now, if we have ka spirantization now what happens in ka spirantization? ka becomes a fricative. So, it becomes r and then uh, which will happen in this environment ka will become r. So, coco will become ko and then we have ga here post nasal voicing because of the preceding nasal with the ka becomes uh, ga here. So, it will be angula and now from our underlying forms here, here we see that the surface forms are ko uh, angular and this one is ilkek and there is no change because we do not have the particular environments required for the change. So, as we had um, talked about this in the previous class that phonology hypothesizes rules to characterize the variation. So, uh, whereas uh, phonetics uh, sounds vary with the context phonology we study the rules and you have seen quite a few rules in the previous class as well as in this lecture. And uh, also you have an idea now about what we mean by varying with the context and what we mean by rules and what we mean by sequencing and distribution. And of course, uh, some other things related to phonology we will cover in the following lectures. Uh, now, the goal of a phonemic analysis is to uh, produce a minimal set of phonemes for the language and it will be a set smaller than the total number of sounds in that language and with the set of phonemes every utterance can be analyzed phonetically. So, when once we have the phonemes and we understand the rules governing the occurrence of the phones we can analyze we can predict the environments in which it will change its shape. And for every pair of sounds we may be able to determine if they are allophones of the same phoneme or if they are allophones of different phonemes. 
and whether two sounds occur in free variation. So, as the name suggests, when two sounds occur in free variation, then the variation cannot be expressed with rules. So, the variation is free, so it can occur in a context which cannot be described by a rule, but the meanings will not change. Only one of the sounds um, occur that is complementary distribution and this can also be expressed with allophonic rules. As we have already uh, gone through this, what is complementary distribution? When two sounds are in complementary distribution, then the context in which they occur do not overlap and the allophones of a phoneme must be in free variation or in complementary distribution or both. So, as we just heard a free variation and complementary distribution can both exist in a language and in complementary distribution we know the exact environment in which something will occur with free variation that kind of rule writing is not possible. Something which is important and we have studied a lot is the importance of context. The analysis uh, consists of organizing the context by seeing which sounds occur in which context. And we have to remember the set of possible contexts always uh, quite large and we start with the most general set of contexts and then refine it on the basis of data. And uh, what immediately follows and precedes is, um, is always relevant and uh, as well as the major sounds and the boundaries of words. As you saw it was expressed with word, if it is word beginning then uh, this is how we express it. If it is end of a word, then we express it. This is how boundaries are expressed. Sometimes it is also expressed with a hashtag word or if this is the start beginning or if it is the end. So, these are various ways of representation of uh, boundaries and also the square brackets show the beginning and the end of a row. So, something we will introduce here is that of a, the idea of a natural class and we will study features in more detail, but we have to give an idea about what natural classes are. So, the idea of natural classes is um, an idea developed in, within generative phonology and um, natural class of sounds in any uh, complete set of sounds is in a given language that share the same value for a feature or set of features. So, the three nasals ma, na and ng in Maasai and in English form a natural class because they constitute the complete set of sounds that share the feature plus nasal. So, uh, this is a natural class and all three of them share uh, a feature, important feature that is nasal. Ta and ka form a natural class in Maasai and English because they constitute the plus stop minus voice sounds of the language. And um, note that we are using categories that we have already seen before stop and plosive and voice and fricative. Uh, when we actually talk about features, then we will see a change in these features in the following lectures, this will become clear. Now, expression of rules in this manner became more and more relevant in uh, generative phonology and here we are showing you a glimpse of that process. So, um, the process of spirantization where we saw that k goes to g when it is between two vowels. Okay. So, this uh, is now, this can be now expressed like this that the plus stop minus voice becomes plus voice minus stop plus fricative in the environment where two, there are two vowels. So, this now shows that the stop is not a stop any longer, but becomes a fricative and it shows the spirantization process instead of just showing that k becomes r. So, a voiceless stop is realized a corresponding voice fricative when surrounded by vowels. So, this is our rule and now this is being expressed with these features. Instead of just saying, instead of just putting the phoneme, we are now describing what those phonemes are. 
And uh, also if you recall Maasai, we have another thing happening there that we have post nasal voicing. So, in post nasal voicing a stop becomes plus voice and that is a minus voice stop becomes plus voice because there is a following nasal. And a voiceless stop is realized as the corresponding voice stop when it follows a nasal consonant and that is our post nasal voicing and it can be expressed like this instead of just expressing it as k instead of saying that k goes to g in the environment where there is a no. This uh, expression of uh, this shows that there is a change in voice just like this showed that there is a change from stop to fricative and instead of writing the phonemes if we also add if we add the description then it captures generalizations. So, phonological rules are based on phonetic features and the set of sounds a rule applies to is a set of sounds that share a particular phonetic feature or set of features. And rules often change only one or two features of a sound rather than making massive alterations. And the rules of Maasai alter voicing and stop fricative distinctions and you can see that there are only one or two features involved. And there are one or two features involved and again repeating the, the first point that the set of sounds a rule applies to it is a set of sounds that share a particular phonetic feature or a set of features. So, the rule applies to, so here the rule applies to k and, and k becomes r. So, what are the features that they share? They share the feature of place of articulation. So, k and r are both villa and, and they change in, um, in this environment they become both plus voice, so, they become g in the environment where uh, when it occurs in this environment, when k occurs in this environment flanked by two vowels it becomes g. The important point pointed out here is that they share a particular feature and that is what we are talking about what feature these to share, they share the place of articulation. Point number one. Point number two rules often change only one or two features of a sound and here how many features uh, have changed it has changed two features it has changed from stop to fricative and it has changed from voiceless to voiced. So, we do not find many more featural changes and that is another thing that uh, is important while noting the environments. The, uh, the sounds uh, appearing in the environment of a rule are almost always a set of sounds that share a particular phonetic feature or features. So, the rule of English that shortens uh, vowels applies before the complete set of consonants in English minus voice. Now, we have um, gone through most of the aspects of a phonemic analysis how to arrive at a set of phonemes, how to um, put down the local environments that is the preceding following, how to write a rule, how we express x goes to y in the environment z and um, what are the other things that we have to keep in mind while we are looking for local environments, how features are in important, how we can show that something changed to something else because there were some common features involved or that there are not too many changes and there are always minimal changes involved. And also we have talked about complementary distribution and contrastive distribution and also distinctiveness which is important to find our minimal pairs. We have also seen near minimal pairs. Let us now also look at uh, some more aspects with regard to phonemes. An important idea that can be attributed to Sapir who wrote a paper by the same name the psychological reality of the phoneme is exactly that the psychological reality of a phoneme. So, how are phonemes psychologically real? We will talk about that in more detail 
And before that, we let us prepare ourselves to understand that with a few examples. So, contrastiveness plays a major role in the perception of language users. When phonetically two sounds are heard by two different listeners A and B, for listener A the sounds are contrastive, distinguish, they distinguish different words in her, in her language and the sounds also occur in like listener B's language are not contrastive, they are allophones. And A can hear the difference between the two sounds with perfect ease, but B has great difficulty. So, but remember the sounds occur in both A as well as B's languages. But why is it easier for A to hear the difference and why is it difficult for B to hear that? And uh, now we have an example from um, Bengali and American English as uh, given is in Hayes 2009 um, introductory phonology. Uh, and this shows that in this dialect of Bengali, dental stops contrast with alveolar stops. And whereas some are you know, dental and some are alveolar. As a result, they are contrastive. However, remember that in English, dentals and alveolar stops, dental and alveolar stops do not contrast, but they can be allophonic. Whereas in this language, it is a contrast. So we have tan versus tan and sat versus sat, and we have dan versus dan and din versus uh, dim. Okay, so we have dental and alveolar sounds. Whereas in American English also, we might find dental and alveolar contrast. We saw that with the nasal and when we saw, we saw nasals and we saw dentalized nasals and dentalized alveolars. And that is possible for stops as well when there is a preceding, uh, when there is a following dental uh, fricative. So, eight the could be dentalized because of following dental fricative. Uh, whereas, and also as in eighth, the t can be uh, dentalized. Uh, however, not unsurprisingly, because speaker A is a, is a speaker of a language where dental and alveolar sounds are not contrastive, speaker A was completely unable to determine to hear the Bengali contrast. And speaker A's inability to hear the dental alveolar distinction is not due to the lack of experience, but because speaker A does not have phonemic contrast in um, her language. So, this shows something very important to us that is the contrastiveness of two phonetically similar sounds lead speakers of the language that has the contrast to focus the perceptual attention on the contrasting sounds and they fail to hear the distinctions. And native speakers hear the differences between phonemes, but they do not hear uh, the difference between allophones and that is precisely the reason that A could not hear the difference between dental versus alveolar. Although it occurs allophonically, whereas in B's language, dental versus alveolar was a phonemic contrastive difference. So, when, when this happens, speakers do not hear the distinction, do not hear the distinction. And when it is phonemic, speakers tune themselves to concentrate on the on the difference and they are perceptually tuned to hear the difference. And um, related to that is the psychological reality of the phoneme, uh, to the idea of the psychological reality of the phoneme is the notion of the same sound. So, groups of mutually non-distinctive sounds are grouped together into categories that is the phonemes. And uh, speakers usually believe that two elephones of the same phoneme are the same sound. So, this is related to what we said uh, just now that speakers do not hear the distinction if it occurs allophonically. And allophones, when speakers utter allophones, they hear them as the same sounds. 
And in, for example, the vowels in ten and ted are different. One is nasalized and the other is not. Because the following nasal in ten, we have a nasalized vowel, unlike in ted. So, vowel becomes nasal when there is a following nasal. But do speakers hear these as different vowels? Speakers do not hear these as different vowels because nasalization is not contrastive in English. So, uh, what is the notion of the same sound? If they exist allophonically, then the speakers hear the same sound. Okay. Now, extending uh, that to other languages where nasalization occurs phonemically, for instance, French. In French, bo, um, bon, or me, me are uh, phonemically distinct because their nasalization is contrastive. Vowel nasalization. is phonemic, which means a and a are two different, um, since these are phonemic, I will use the slanted brackets. So, these, this is, this is phonemic. As a result, now for French speakers, it is plain that a and a are different sounds. So, the difference between a French speaker and an English speaker is the phonemic structure of two languages. So, when they produce a a in English, speakers will not hear the difference. Whereas, for French speakers, this is a vital difference because it will signal two different, can mean different words. Corresponding nasal and oral vowels in French count as different sounds because they are different phonemes and they count as the same sound in English because they are allophones of the same phoneme. A few brief points about accents and um, transfer and speakers internalize rules that derive the various allophones in their environments. The behavior of speakers attempting to pronounce the words of a language which is new to them it is called foreign accent and most often it persists after even years of practice with a second language. And the phenomenon of mispronunciation in second language is always attributable to the phonology of the first language and that is called transfer. So, obviously it is not mispronunciation, but speakers use their phonology, uh, second language phonology while speaking their first language. Now, importantly there are, can be also other things there. So, you can have completely novel things in a second language and um, that will uh, not be transfer, um, that will be uh, maybe uh, universal language or some properties which appear uh, which is not there in uh, the first language of the speaker or the language, the target language and there can be completely novel um, innovations in a second language context. So, but most of the time there are a lot of transfers from the first language to the second language. And transfer is to consider phonology as specifying the set of things that are pronunciable in a given language. So, and the set of things that are pronunciable are the legal sequences of phonemes which are realized as appropriate allophones. And the sequences of phonemes in one language can be realized as certain allophones which are appropriate in that context for those speakers learning a second language. So, uh, anything outside this set will involve uh, one of the three properties as we just said that there could be other innovations. So, it can be phonologically illegal because it contains an illegal phoneme. Any utterance containing the voice uvular fricative is illegal in English because that never occurs in English. It can be phonologically illegal because it corresponds to an illegal sequence of phonemes because that is not allowed in the phonology of language, or phonology of English and English phonology does not permit the phonemes in certain orders. So, this is not possible in English, this is illegal in English, burner is completely illegal in English. And it can be legal because it corresponds to an impossible distribution of phonemes in English. Uh, example, this one 
this word is this is not possible in English. Why? Because because in English because in English whenever there is a surface form with a final l, it has to be always velarized and it has to be filled. If a word of a foreign language is uh, phonologically illegal for any of the three reasons, it will not be pronounced correctly by English speakers. And finally, in French, um, tante uh, has a nasalized vowel alien to the English phoneme inventory. So, in an English accent, this comes out as uh, tante, where na is particularly short. And um, now, if we do a derivation of our English speakers of uh, French, and um, these are the steps that will involve this. So, we have this underlying form of tant, and we have a, uh, and we have nasalization, which leads to a, uh, and then we have nasal consonant, which is shortened. And as a result, we have the surface English form of tant. And this now uh, shows uh, all these topics show something vital that we will again discuss the psychological reality of the phoneme. And the phoneme is considered psychologically real because the speakers hear only the phoneme, they do not hear the allophone. And this can be extended to various contexts as in transfer, as in foreign accent and transfer and uh, illegal uh, sequences in a particular language and how uh, they manifest in, in another language. So, when you are learning a second language, how the rhotic in French, which is not legal in, it's not, not legal phoneme in English, and how it will appear as um, a certain uh, manifestation of the um, English rhotic and um, other things show the, the psychological reality of the phoneme of the first language that speakers are used to uh, speaking. So, uh, this brings us to the third lecture uh, on phonology and in the next class, we will continue with the psychological reality of phoneme and also look at a big set of examples which show uh, phonological derivations and we will go through those examples so that we understand all the processes involved in phonological um, processes and the methods for determining phonemes and how do we arrive at the set of phonemes that are there in a language and how do we analyze different phonological processes which are also there along with the phonemes which exist in that language. So, thank you for listening and we will keep talking about phonology in a couple of more lectures. Thank you. Mm -hmm.